Good morning. Good morning. John Davis here. I hope everyone is in good health and good spirits. These are challenging times of uncertainty, confusion, and in some cases, fear. So we wanted to do all we could to keep you informed. And as a result, we've organized this Guardian Capital Advisor webinar. We thought it would be a good idea in light of the unprecedented events surrounding COVID-19 and capital markets to give you a, an opportunity to hear directly from one of your portfolio managers. We're fortunate to have Mark Brodner here. Uh, Gu Guardian, Guardian uh, manages about $3.2 billion in private client assets and, and close to about $28 billion in institutional assets such as pension plans. Mark is a is a chartered financial analyst with 15 years experience in the industry. He's based in Vancouver where he attended SFU and played football. And when he's not helping take care of your hard earned money, he's busy with three little kids. The littlest just having turned one. I'm uh, always looking for a silver lining in this whole COVID uh, crisis. So um, for Mark, working from home, he was fortunate enough to see his youngest daughter's first step. So he wouldn't otherwise have had that opportunity. So that's the silver lining for the day. Uh, before we get going, we have a, a few housekeeping items to cover. Uh, this is our first webinar. We wanted to get this information to you quickly. So please be patient if we run into any technology glitches. During the presentation, feel free to ask questions. All attendees' microphones have been muted to cut down on background noise. So in order to ask a question, please use the chat box provided in the upper right-hand corner. It says Q&A on the, on the icon. We will have one of the Blackburn Davis uh, uh, team bring these, these questions forward to Mark. If you're not able to ask your question or think of something afterwards, of course, we will be uh, Mark will be available offline uh, via phone or email to answer any questions you have. Um, there should be an icon uh, of a microphone under each speaker. Please make sure that it is unmuted or you won't be able to hear the presenter. Um, as this is the first time for us, any feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, even well after our social distancing requirements have passed, we may continue with this sort of event if it's uh, well received and, and also you find value in it. So, Mark, are you ready to go? I am ready, yes. Thank you, John. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the, the nice uh, introduction. There have been, been a few silver linings around the house here, although I'd be remiss not to uh, to give full credit to my wife taking care of the, the three little ones, five and under. So she's our she's our in-house superhero, as I know a lot of uh, a lot of parents are, you know, around uh, around the world these days. But um, but yeah, thanks again, John, and for all the great work you continue to do for for clients. And hello to everybody out there. Um, on behalf of uh, Guardian Capital and my fellow portfolio managers, Mike Frisbee and and Michael Barkley, who many of you work with, I'd like to to thank you all for for taking the time here to join us today. Um, certainly timely in light of what's going on, uh, you know, economically and and financially in the markets, um, along with everything else in our in our lives, is being disrupted certainly. Uh, but you know, first and foremost, of course, we we hope you and and your loved ones are are well and and healthy and and staying mentally strong as well as we you know endure all these times. As I as I echo John's uh, sentiment there. So just quickly, I'm going to give you a sort of a brief overview of of um, you know what's been going on economically and and in the markets in terms of of how everything's been impacted by by the virus and effectively the economic uh, economic shutdown excuse me um and then i'll let you know a little bit about sort of how guardian's been positioned through this and why perhaps we're you know we're getting through things a little bit better than, than i think many clients might um might, might expect or or realize so i'll touch on a little bit of our positioning and and the strategy moving forward so with that said i will uh, get going here so i think the the you know the title of the first slide basically says it all here you know uncertainty reigns um and and the markets really are in the position of having to try to effectively quantify the unknown. We're starting to see a little bit of the economic fallout and, and consequences of the global economy being effectively shut down. Uh, but as you can see here, this is a chart of the, the global economic policy uncertainty index and uh, COVID-19 has, has taken it to renewed highs after it had, it had eased uh, with the de-escalation of, of trade tensions between China and the United States. Uh, but you know, as the old saying goes, uncertainty breeds contempt, and that's certainly what we've seen in terms of the the global stock markets. Uh, you know, beginning in, in late February, was just the you know the uncertainty. Uh, you know, creates a lot of angst amongst market 
participants. You know, we, we've since seen a rebound and there's some areas of the market are holding up better than others, but it's certainly, you know, uncertain times on, on so many levels for, for us all, of course. But just to give everybody a bit of perspective on things. So this is a chart of the S&P 500, uh, which is the, the main market in the United States. You know, look anywhere you look around the world, give or take, it's, it's pretty much the same. So markets peaked uh, around the 21st of February and they hit their trough for their low point on on March the 20th. So March, the week of March 16th to 20th saw a, you know, a very swift sell off in the markets. And in that time, you know, the S&P 500 fell 35 percent. Um, you know, obviously, a, you know, a significant drop. The good news in all of this is we have since that time, you know, also seen a, a fairly significant bounce, uh, which has been, you know, equally relatively quick also. Um, so I think that's been encouraging to see in that, you know, we are at least seeing the beginning of the bottom starting to form here in the markets. And I think investors can take some some solace in that. And what's, I guess, you know, interesting, if nothing else, is it wasn't just the, the magnitude of that drop, it was just how swift it was. So this was the, the fastest 20% drop um, or the fastest entrance into a quote unquote bear market um, that we've seen in history. So it took just 20 days for the S&P 500 to drop 20%. So, you know, it happened very quickly. And I think there's, you know, various reasons people point to. If nothing else, perhaps it's just the, you know, the uncertainty, um, you know, and, and the fear, frankly, around the virus itself and, and what the impact will be. I think a large part of it as well is that, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of automated trading that takes place these days um, and, and algorithms that are built into different trading platforms, which typically tend to accentuate more than ever moves, you know, both to the upside and to the downside. So more and more we're seeing these, you know, accentuated, accelerated moves, frankly, in both directions of the market. And, and that's why you know, since you know, since that date on March the 20th, we've had several very large updates as well uh, amidst all of this. So it, it tends to happen in um, in both directions. I think for inv investors, certainly longer term investors, as unnerving as the period this may have been, perspective is certainly certainly helpful here. So this is the, that same S&P 500, but over a five year period as opposed to year to date. And I just wrote, you know, um, uh, brought in that black line to the chart there. And you can see that the market is actually positive going back to January of 2019. So in spite of everything that's happened, you know, the market is still quote unquote in the green for the past 15 plus months. So I think it's important for, you know, it's for, for investors to, to again, keep, keep that perspective in, in mind. Uh, and certainly for longer term investors, you know, they, they've reaped the benefits of what has been a strong bull market over the past several years. And, and unfortunately, these, these times of, of uncertainty and, and discomfort when the market falls are, are part of the process of, of investing in, in uh, you know, uh, equity markets and, and enjoying in part the, the higher long term returns that they can provide to investors over time, as opposed to having your money in, in a savings account or GIC or, or something like that. But, um, you know, I guess the point being here is, is certainly all is all is far from lost. I, I think I'll just go through a few interesting slides here that sort of show the magnitude of the, uh, you know, of the economic fallout of all this. And I'll preface this by saying that, you know, in, in many cases, the market has already priced much of this in. So, you know, with each new additional uh, bit of economic data, you know, the market is not sort of, um, for the most part, the market has actually really been taking it in stride. In fact, on many days when some of these figures, for example, on U.S. claims filings come out, uh, the market's actually been positive, believe it or not. But um, but this here is a chart of the the U.S. initial unemployment claims filings um, weekly in the in the thousands here. So you can see that effectively, I mean, overnight the unemployment claims in the United States went from a couple hundred thousand to close to seven million in in the span of a week. It, it is so you, know, you can see even comparing back to 08, 09, nothing like we've ever seen before. Uh, you know, given the economy is effectively shut down, I suppose it's not surprising, but you know, just just certainly a, a fascinating chart to look at. Um, you know, for for the optimists or realists, perhaps I would point out that since that 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 close to seven million figure was two weeks ago, and the two weeks since the number of claims has actually dipped. Uh, but most recently it was 5.2 million. So you know, perhaps. Um, you know, we, we sort of hit that peak and it came very quickly. And now hopefully, uh, you know, as the economy is able to reopen and, and get back to some sort of normalcy, you know, we'll see those numbers decline perhaps, you know, quite sharply as well, I think is, is probably the expectation. Similar situation here in Canada where, uh, you know, a million Canadians lost their job in the month of March. Um, you know, again, uh, sort of uh, unlike any level we've seen previously, 
the Canadian GDP contracted 9% in, in the month of March. Um, so again, you know, big numbers here, but really I don't, I don't think anybody's necessarily surprised by it given the circumstances. And, and again, the market hasn't necessarily been surprised by it. And, and I think it's already pricing in much of this. And, and to some extent, in, in a sense, it seems it's almost been perhaps not as, um, you know, not as dire just yet as, as maybe the markets expected. And that's perhaps why we've seen a bit of a, a bit of a recovery. Uh, another chart here, uh, these are the Global Purchasing Managers Index. So essentially just a level, uh, uh, excuse me, a reflection of the level of activity on both the manufacturing and the services sector in the economy. So you can see the services sector, which is sort of circle in red at the bottom, has been hit especially hard. So any level below that, that 50 uh, level dotted line denotes a, a contraction or a slowdown in activity. And, and certainly, you know, anything around airlines, hospitality, restaurant, bricks and mortar retail, you know, that services side of the economy has been hit especially hard. Um, but again, there are there are sort of signs of optimism here. If we look at the the manufacturing sector, which is the top red circle there, perhaps surprisingly, you'll see there's actually been an uptick in manufacturing activity recently. And that is in large part a reflection of the, the Asian and Chinese economy in particular coming back online. So it's, it's hard to get accurate information out of, out of China, but you know, anecdotally, we're, we're estimating that roughly 80 to 90 percent of that manufacturing capacity has come back online. So that's why we've seen that slight uptick there. Uh, and for us in North America, where the onset of the virus came later, um, you know, perhaps it's a signal that there is indeed, you know, an, an end, uh, uh, excuse me, a light at the end of the tunnel. So I think that should be, you know, an encouraging sign for, for all of us. And that's certainly something we're continuing to, to monitor quite closely. This is an interesting one, just, I, you know, we don't really have any exposure to restaurants or anything of that nature, but you can see here, this is a, a chart of seated diners at restaurants. Uh, you know, and it's effectively gone to, you know, to zero overnight. And, you know, as you know, restaurants are effectively, you know, closing down and having to adapt and, and do delivery and takeout and all these different measures. But, um, you know, again, I just sort of another just very sort of fascinating chart, something I, I you know, I'm surreal or we never thought we would see. But, um, you know, but this is the situation we're in. And again, it's, I think, a reflection of that services side of the economy, uh, you know, being hit, being hit uh, especially hard through through this period of time. So oil is, um, you know, sort of the, the topic of the day, certainly, um, you know, for those who, of you who, who follow the business news or even the, the, the regular news at all, I mean, you may have seen that the price of oil actually went negative yesterday afternoon. So this was, I think I clipped this about, will it be 2.30 your time? Uh, and the price of oil for delivery in May was negative $18. So if you were a buyer of oil, you would get a barrel of oil and they would give you $18 to take it off their hands. And this should all be taken with a grain of salt because it just has to do with how markets, um, the oil trades in the, in the futures markets. So for perspective, as I mentioned, this is for delivery in May. Um, if you were purchasing a barrel for delivery in June, it was it's positive $15 and it's up over $20 in July. Uh, so it's really just a function of trading. It's a bit technical, but the, the point is that, you know, there, there's a glut of supply and, and we're running out of places to store it. And it's effectively been a, a double whammy in the in the oil market with um, the Saudis and the Russians have effectively been, been flooding the market prior to all of this, um, in large part likely to try to squeeze out the US uh, producers. And now of course with the, the COVID induced significant drop in demand, you know, we, they have come to an agreement to cut supply just recently by a little over 9 billion barrels a day, I believe, but um, you know, certainly there's the point being that, you know, there's just a glut of supply and there's nowhere to store it at this point. Um, and that's what's causing these severe gyrations, uh, you know, in the energy market. I, I will say, though, that, you know, in spite of it being, you know, seemingly, seemingly, uh, you know, reaching the point of capitulation, you know, we do know that even in it, from sort of a best case perspective in terms of the advancement of renewable energy, uh, you know, the global economy is going to continue to rely on energy for, you know, a significant period of time moving forward, decades at least in part. And, and so I think there will be a turnaround here. Uh, it's just hard to see what the catalyst will be at this point until we get some sort of resumption of, um, you know, of, of economic activity. But certainly as, as uh, you know, Albertans know, it's just been a very, very uh, challenging time and, and they've taken yet another uh, blow here just, just recently. 
Not surprisingly, one uh, one thing we've seen throughout this period of time is significant strength in the U.S. dollar. So there's been a real flight to safety, and this is typical in, in volatile periods. So the U.S. dollar has really appreciated. Uh, this is a chart of the U.S. dollar relative to the Canadian dollar, but it's effectively the same against all major global currencies. Uh, I know everybody's on mute, so you can't answer, but I'd, uh, hazard, uh, if I would ask you to hazard a guess as to the one currency that might have been stronger than the U.S. dollar through this period, and that would be the Japanese yen. So also very typical, we've seen the U.S. dollar and Japanese yen being very strong. Um, the one implication of this, um, I don't think too many of us are traveling down south at this point, so we don't necessarily need to buy U.S. dollars for travel or anything, um, but for, for Canadian investors, the strong U.S. dollar has helped offset any losses in foreign investments. So if you own U.S. stocks or international securities or, or U.S. dollar bonds, just owning those U.S. dollars in and of themselves because the currency is appreciated, when we translate those returns back to Canadian dollars, uh, it, it appears to have held up seemingly much better than, say, the Canadian market, but that's in large part because of the, the currency benefit. So we have seen that offset against some of the, um, you know, any, any declines we may have seen in, in global markets. So it's, it's actually been beneficial in large part for, for Canadian investors. You know, not surprisingly, we've seen a, a huge response from federal governments around the world, and, and it has provided a, you know, a stabilizing measure and, and a measure of confidence for the markets. Uh, we, we've seen, in terms of a monetary response from central banks around the world, you know, they've cut rates effectively to zero, and in some cases, we've seen negative interest rates. They've uh, unleashed, unleashed massive quantitative easing programs, which you know, essentially is fancy language for just pumping liquidity, pumping money into the system. Just recently in, in Canada, the Bank of Canada announced for the first time ever they're going to uh, begin providing liquidity or purchasing securities in uh, not just federal government of Canada bonds, but provincial bonds and uh, also high quality corporate bonds, which is typically where we're concentrated in Guardian. So that's been helpful for, for confidence and liquidity on the fixed income side, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, but also the fiscal response, so the spending from, from federal governments is, is close to 12% on average of, of GDP in the G7 countries. So just you know a significant amount of spending. I think they learned in part from 08, 09 to not worry about getting these measures perfect, but you know, get the money out the door and, and have the tap start flowing, if you will, as quickly as possible. And, and that's what we've seen in terms of the, you know, the wage subsidies, the the loan guarantees, um, you know, deferrals from property taxes, all these different types of measures that they're, they're coming out with. Um, and, and the hope really is, is to try to see the consumer, to see that small business owner through to the other side of all this, where you know, hopefully the, biz, the economy can open up relatively quickly, even if it's in a phased manner, uh, and these businesses can, you know, can can survive based on some of the support from the government, and and these individuals will get their job back. In other words, you know, prevent this health crisis from becoming a full blown financial crisis. And and you know, there are ramifications for this long term in terms of the, the debt that's being added. Uh, you know, sort of second and third layer effects that uh, are yet to be yet to be seen, and perhaps you know can't quite be known just yet. But I think that you know, in the short term. They're certainly doing all they can to to try to provide some confidence and stability and and a, at least the vision of a pathway through for people who may have lost their job or lost their business and and I think it is working to to some extent uh, you know it was interesting the the Bank of Canada governor outgoing governor Governor Pelosi made a comment the other day you know that nobody ever blamed a firefighter for using too much water if they put the fire out and I think that's sort of the response here is you know we'll we'll deal with the consequences down the road but if we can provide some stability, then that's what we need to do in the short term. And, and that's been a, a confidence builder. And that has also been part of the reason that we've seen the markets begin to, um, you know, begin to recover. So that gives you a bit of a lay of the land, I guess, you know, sort of uh, market wise and economically. And, and of course, a lot of it seems quite negative, but you know, that's not necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily translate to what's been going on in, in client portfolios. And there's certain things that have been working that, and others that aren't. But, uh, you know, there's a couple reasons, again, why I think at Guardian we've managed to, to make our way through this on, on relatively stable footing. Um, you know, and one of them is being that throughout much of 2019, and, and this is in no way, shape or form to claim that we somehow have the crystal ball and saw this coming, but we were proactive in, in managing risk last year and, and taking advantage of, of the relative strength we saw in markets to try to trim equity or risk in portfolios in, in a tax efficient way 
and make sure that the portfolios weren't drifting too far above the stated equity or risk target in a given client's investment policy statement. Um, and, and having done that has, has proved very beneficial. It's meant that we haven't had to suddenly try to switch and play defense or act reactively in what has been a very challenged, irrational market. Um, and and there were, you know, I mentioned earlier that perhaps, you know, the markets were ahead of the underlying economy. And, and we were seeing that to some extent where, for example, manufacturing actually dipped into contraction in the United States in, in 2019. Uh, you know, signals from the bond market around the invasion of the yield curve, excuse me, inversion of the yield curve, uh, these types of things, just global debt levels where they were already and where we are in the cycle were, were things that gave us pause or red flags. So we were we were proactive in, in reducing or, or trimming equity um, and trying to protect some of those gains. And that, again, has certainly been helpful coming into this. And that's just what the bar, uh, excuse me, the graph at the bottom shows, which probably looks familiar to many of you from your quarterly statements. The blue bar is just a range of, um, you know, an allowable range for a given asset class. And the yellow dot is where we're positioned currently. And this is just the, one example of a client. Different clients have different asset mixes, but, you know, it should look pretty similar for everybody in that the yellow dot is basically right in the middle, indicating we're sort of at, you know, at a neutral stance policy wise. And, and we haven't been overweight risk or, or equity in a given client's portfolio. And again, that's certainly been, been helpful through all of this. Uh, that may be just a quick um, you know, refresher on our philosophy and approach would also help explain why, why we're managing through this um, relatively well is you know, first and foremost, our, I think our guiding ethos, if you will, at Guardian, and I'm sure you know, John and the team have, have reinforced this to you uh, over time, is that you know, we place a great emphasis on, on risk management and, and capital, and, uh, capital protection and regular income in the client portfolio. So, Clients who come to Guardian typically have created a certain amount of wealth in their life by whatever means, and they come to us to grow it prudently in the context of the market, but not take undue risk for them. And, and that's why we focus on you know, large cap, blue chip, dividend paying companies. And I'll, you know, the dividend, um, dividend payers and dividend growth is a key crux to what we, what we do. So I'll speak to that uh, briefly in a minute here. But you know, it's also a lower turnover. So we try to focus on after tax return for for clients. Uh, high active share just means that we're, you know, we're benchmark agnostic. So we don't need to track a, a given uh, sector weighting relative to a benchmark in any given way, which typically means just based on the type of companies we invest in, we're a little bit more concentrated in, you know, areas like the utilities, the telecom, consumer staples. So some of those more, so call it slow and steady areas of the market and less so in the more cyclical areas um, like energy, for example. So what, what this translates to in terms of an output for a portfolio is, is a smoother return over time. So we give up a little bit of the upside when times are really good, um, but the relative outperformance comes at times like this, where we provide capital preservation and downside protection and these companies we invest in while not immune, uh, certainly tend to hold up a little bit better at times such as this. And that's what we're seeing play out you know, in this most recent period as well. And, and ultimately, you know, what we're trying to do is, is achieve the specific objectives that have been born from the planning process that you've gone through with John's team. And, and frankly, if we structure things properly, uh, you know, whether markets are up or down for a given period of time, you know, if we have things structured properly, we're still going to meet those objectives for, for, for clients over the long term. And of course, that's the ultimate, the ultimate goal. So just quickly on dividends, why do we place such an emphasis on, on dividends? Um, and those of you who follow Guardian a bit closer may have seen a, a couple of these slides before, but we know that historically, uh, you know, 66% of returns in the equity markets come from, from the power of dividends and reinvesting and compounding of that income and in portfolio over time. So there's oftentimes a common misconception that the way you make money in the stock market is to sort of pick the next you know, penny stock, if you will, that's going to go to a thousand dollars and then you can sell it right at the peak and do it all over again. And we know that's just, you know, even the Warren Buffetts of the world cannot do that consistently, even if you get lucky once or twice. So it's about, you know, buying good quality companies, owning them for long periods of time and collecting the income that comes with them along the way. We also know that over a full cycle, and I think this data goes back to the early 80s, if I'm not mistaken, that companies that grow a dividend, so it's not just about find the companies that pay the highest dividend, but companies that grow the dividend typically provide over a full market cycle 
the highest returns for investors with the relatively least amount of volatility. And so that's why we concentrate in this sector of, of the market. Um, and this isn't always the case, you know, in the recent run up, for example, admittedly, some of the growth stocks, the technology stocks had led the market. But, you know, over time, we know this is a prudent strategy and, and we know it works and we have conviction in it. And again, it's helping to see us through this this challenging time. And and one last point on on dividends here and, and rising dividends in particular is, you know, if you if you just step back and think about it for a moment, a company that's able to pay a rising dividend to you as an owner. Uh, in, in a sustainable way, meaning they've got the rising earnings, profitability and cash flows to support that dividend, you know, they must have some sort of competitive advantage or moat in their competitive, um, you know, in, in their sector or in their landscape. They're probably a well-run, well-managed company. They're likely efficient in allocating their capital. You know, all those types of attributes, um, you know, a rising dividend are a reflection of, the, of that type of good quality company, which is probably the type of company you want to own uh, for a long period of time and collect the dividends along the way. And typically that's, you know, that's what we try to do here here at Guardian. And again, it's these types of companies that, that are seen as true, what has been a challenging time in the market, uh, you know, well on a, on a relative basis. So in terms of the market, uh, you know, what, what's been working, what hasn't been working out there. So perhaps not surprisingly, it, it is some of these more defensive sectors in the market where, where we've been concentrated that have been holding up, you know, relatively well. So consumer staples, for example, um, you know, Walmart in particular is a name we we own for many clients that's that's held up, you know, exceptionally well. It's actually been up near all time highs. They're, they're hiring people to support a growing business even during these times, um, you know, and that's in large part because they invested significant resources um, several years back and ongoing, uh, but made the initial capital investment several years back to develop an online platform. And, and people at the time sort of scoffed or laughed at them for trying to compete with the Amazons of the world. Well, that's really truly benefiting them to, you know, uh, to a great extent at a time such as this. You know, it, sectors like healthcare with Johnson & Johnson on, on the front lines of trying to develop a, a vaccine. Uh, you know, telecommunication. So NTT is uh, Nippon Telephone and Telegraph. We call them the, the Bell Canada of Japan. They're the largest incumbent telecom in Japan. So very stable cash flows, you know, good sight lines into their earnings, uh, you know, irrespective of, uh, you know, irrespective of what's going on economically, you know, the demand is fairly stable in, in with companies, uh, you know, in that in that sector. So those areas of the market have been have been faring quite well. Perhaps not surprisingly, you know, in addition to the easy ones, you know, airlines, hospitality, restaurants, you know, energy and materials in particular have struggled. Uh, not surprisingly, there's more cyclical areas. We do have some exposure there, but, you know, it's it's relatively lower, much lower, frankly, compared to the benchmark. Again, because the more cyclical nature, they don't they typically tend to get screened out of our um, out of our process. I, I highlighted REITs here, not because we, we actually don't have any REIT exposure for a variety of reasons, which which is sort of beyond the scope of our discussion today. Uh, but REITs are one area of the market. Typically, when times are challenging, that they hold up quite well. Well, it's been quite the opposite this time around. And it's it's interesting because I think that's a reflection of the acceleration of trends um, that were already in place, but, uh, but, but are being, again, accelerated by the situation that we're in, um, you know, such as me coming to you today from from our home office, um, you know, I, I think that businesses perhaps are, are going to come out of this realizing that, you know, maybe it's not just feasible for for us to operate from home. Maybe in a lot of ways it's actually advantageous. And you know, perhaps one of the the thoughts coming out of this is how do we maybe restructure things? Is there a portion of our workforce that can work from home from home and and maybe benefit from that work life balance? Uh, and at the same time, while we don't necessarily close the storefront altogether. Perhaps we can have, you know, we don't need as much, um, you know, commercial space as we did previously, or you know, we don't need that, you know, as much bricks and uh, mortar retail uh, anymore. And so I think it's an acceleration of these trends. And and interestingly, you know, REITs have been been a, a negative byproduct of that in, in the market here. So looking ahead. Um, you know, again, just keeping in mind, right? Some areas of the market have, have performed better than others, but you know, ju just sort of broadly speaking, moving forward, you know, all, all of a sudden valuations have gone from looking relatively expensive to uh, you know relatively cheap and in very short order. So this is the the forward price to earnings ratio of the U.S. stock market. It could be for any given market around the world, um, but again, just the valuation metric, and you can see anything above that that top dark black line is expensive. Anything below is quote unquote cheap. 
And and all of a sudden we've got down where valuations are, are suddenly looking a lot more attractive and maybe there's some opportunities on the equity side. Uh, you know, could they go lower? I mean, potentially you can see at 08, 09 they did. Um, you know, have we reached the bottom? Perhaps, but I think, you know, even around these levels now with the recovery, I think looking back in time, you know, three, five years hence, we'll, we'll sort of look at this period and, and look at, you know, think perhaps it was an opportunistic time to, um, you know, to be adding to to some of the good quality companies that we own. And, and that's certainly one of the things that we're looking at doing. And I'll speak to that in, um, you know, in just a moment. Also interesting sort of in the same line of thinking is the the bearish sentiment or the negativity around stock markets has grown significantly recently. And, and it's reached a point where typically historically it's signaled we're, we're at or near the bottom of the market. So we're seeing some of those contrarian indicators that are are, are in actually positive signs as, as we view them. Um, you know, that, that again, I think a healthy bottoming process is, is probably underway here in the markets and investors should be, should be, um, you know, reassured by that, by that fact and that process that's taking place. You know, we often spend a lot of time talking about equities in this business, but I'd remiss not to, to touch on the fixed income side of the market. So what's been going on with, with fixed income? Uh, so this is just a chart of global bond yields. So, the lower line is, is government debt, and you can see it's actually ticked down recently. So that is a reflection of central banks around the world cutting interest rates to try to support the economy. Um, the investment grade or, or the higher quality corporate debt is that middle black line, and the blue uh, line is the is the high yield market. And so you can see that you know the credit spreads, if you will, or the compensation that you receive for owning a, a non-government bond um, have widened out to some extent. You know, in, you know, it's been relatively stable or healthy in, in the sandbox we play in, if you will, which is that high quality corporate market. Um, and so things have been fairly stable there. You know, liquidity has been fairly good throughout this. It's, it's certainly been helped by the government of Canada stepping in. Um, so, you know, we're again playing, being relatively defensive, similar to the equity strategy on the fixed income side and sticking to the high quality credit, which has meant perhaps giving up a little bit of, of annual yield has proven very beneficial because what we're seeing in the high yield space and, and as is typical at times such as this, um, and there is there is room for exposure for certain clients given the circumstances, but you know, the high yield market has come under you know, a fair bit of pressure. Uh, you know, the liquidity has really tightened up. Um, it's, it's since eased, this was primarily a few weeks back, but it, it's eased since then, but we, we did see signs of stress in that market. Um, you know, so point being, I just think it's, it's it's never a good idea to to quote unquote stretch for yield, which I think some investors did, which means, you know, well, if I, you know, the mar everything seems pretty good, the economy seems good, well, I can go down, you know, invest in this company that's, you know, a notch or two lower in terms of the credit rating, and I might get an extra 1% a year, and, you know, that's going to help with the income in the portfolio, uh, you know, and there's typically that works until it doesn't work, and in a lot of cases now that is, you know, that stopped working, so, um, you know, I was looking just for, for example, this isn't a bond that we own, but just as an example, uh, many of you may be familiar with Baytex Energy. So they had a corporate bond that back at the beginning of March was trading around $90. Um, the company got downgraded. And now, uh, you know, if somebody will buy it from you, the last marked price on it was $35. And keep in mind that you paid $100 to buy this bond in the first place. So, you know, if a company, you know, if you're not sure if a company is going to be able to pay you your capital back when times are, are tough, that extra one or two dollars in interest or yield per year is absolutely not worth it. So that's certainly something we've avoided at Guardian. And again, being more prudent on the fixed income side has been, um, you know, has been beneficial here, here as well. So what's, you know, what's what's our approach going to be moving forward through through all of this? So I, I think there's, you know, just painting with broad strokes here. There's sort of two general processes that that are going on at Guardian right now, and and the first one is you know, a continuous process to revisit all of the names that we own, both on, on the equity and fixed income side, uh, you know, to, to try to be proactive and assess for, for risk of permanent capital impairment. So in other words, are there companies we own that, that we fear might not get through this or on the, say, the equity side? Are there, are there companies that we own on the fixed income side that we fear might not be able to pay us our capital back when a bond matures? And, you know, for the most part right now, we're comfortable saying that's, that's not the case. Uh, but you know we're, we're we're you know taking our due diligence, if you will, to to new levels to to ensure that we avoid those types of situations in 
in the portfolio. So that's you know that's one process that's continuously ongoing. And then you know we can't become too myopic in our um, you know in our analysis either. We need to be forward looking and you know, look at some of the names in the portfolio that had perhaps felt more than their pair of, uh, more than their fair share of, of pain. Uh, or you know are there names on the watch list companies we've been looking at for potentially years, but the valuation from a long term investment return standpoint has just never made much sense. So are there areas uh, or companies, excuse me, that you know we've liked for a long time where all of a sudden those valuations look a lot more attractive? So you know what we need to do and what we are doing is looking at this time as an opportunity to enhance or strengthen the overall quality of portfolios coming out of this. And, and we want to come through the other side of this stronger than we came into it. And you know we're absolutely you know pooling all of our resources as, as a firm um, you know, and our collective experience and expertise and, you know, partnering with our institutional counterparts that John alluded to earlier, um, you know, to really pull together and 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 revisit a lot of the these names in our process and and make sure that we're not just going to make it through this, which we will, but we're going to come through stronger than we came into it. And I think so far we're, you know, we're fairly well positioned to, um, you know, to do that. And there's just a bit of a flow chart on, on sort of our, our investment, um, you know, process. And I'm not really going to get into the weeds. Of course, there's uh, you know, an entire proprietary system and, and process that we use to to select securities and, and structure and manage portfolios, you know, but the point I really want to make is, you know, it's it's sticking to that discipline and, and sticking to that process and having conviction both in good times and bad, uh, you know, that's critical to to being able to to remove emotion, if you will, as much as possible from the the day to day decision making process. And, you know, that's very much what we're trying to do at at Guardian, and, and I do think we're, you know, we're in a good shape to come out of this. Um, you know, not just you know, we've not just been getting through this relatively well. I think we're well positioned to come out of it on on strong footing as well. So I think that should be, um, you know, it's certainly encouraging for us as as portfolio managers to see how things have moved through, and, and hopefully it's encouraging for um, you know for for our clients and, and investors as well. So three thoughts in, you know, just sort of uh, general comments I'd make in, in closing here to leave you with are, you know, it's important to keep in mind that markets are, are forward looking. So markets are going to bottom out long before any of the economic indicators signal that we have the all clear, so to speak. Um, you know, just as they swiftly sold off before any real economic data came out showing the implications of this, uh, they too will begin to recover. And, and was March the 20th? which again was the prior low in the markets. Was that the, the day the market bottom? Perhaps it was, um, perhaps it wasn't. So I, I think, you know, caution and patience is still warranted. Uh, you know, and this again is sort of in line with our general philosophy at Guardian. You know, it's likely that, that the bounce we've seen could at least in part be retraced and the, the gyrations in the oil market are causing a bit of that these past couple of days here. Uh, but, you know, one strategy, we, you know, we are, or one uh, situation we have to brace ourselves for is, is potentially to retouch those lows. It, it doesn't mean we will, but, you know, historically this bottoming process is, um, you know, can be a little bit messy, so to speak, and there's a few head fakes along the way. Um, that's not necessarily a negative thing. In fact, I think it's encouraging that, you know, we, we've seen the bounce and, and there, is, there is a means by which markets go through a healthy bottoming, and I think we're well on our, our, well on our way to that. Um, which, which is an, an encouraging sign, but I still think a, bit, a little bit of caution, a little bit of patience is, um, you know, is warranted, and that we don't necessarily dive, need to dive into the equity or the risk markets in spite of valuations looking, you know, somewhat uh, or much more frankly attractive than they did not too, um, not too long ago. And you know, the, the last, the, the, the last comment I would make is, you know, we certainly will get through this. Of course, you know, hopefully with our you know, our health first and foremost, as I've said to a lot of people in my personal life, you know, who've been affected in different ways. I mean, so long as we come through this with our health, you know, um, you know, everything else will, will end up sorting itself out in, in the end. But, um, you know, we do know that, you know, we continue to do our, you know, our job to the absolute best of our abilities at, at, at Guardian, um, you know, which is to ensure clients' financial health. And as, as hard as it is to see, it, it is inevitable that we'll get through this and, and that, you know, the the cash flows and the, the profitability, the earnings of the, the companies that you own as investors will, you know, will once again grow um, as well the dividends that they pay to you. And so I think, you know, it's hard to put a time frame on it at this point, but, you know, I would leave you with that that encouraging thought that, you know, I think we're making progress towards it and, and we're certainly going to, you know, come through the other side of this and, you know, potentially it might, um, 
you know, it might not be as, as long or it might potentially come quicker than perhaps, um, you know, some some uh, investors may realize or, or the news media may may have you believe with some of the headlines that you see. So um, I think that's the end of that, the formal presentation. So so thank you again for for taking the time and, and I'll turn it over back to uh, to John and the team, I guess, to to field any questions for me that you ha may have out there. Thanks for Thanks that, for that uh, uh, Mark. Um, Stephen McDonald from Blackburn Davis Financial. Uh, a couple of questions I have uh, going forward. Uh, the first one is, um, you know, given how many companies drive income from the oil and gas industry, what's Guardian doing to manage the exposure to that sector? And uh, I guess the other companies that might have ties. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I, I would say the one thing, you know, you know, the one thing initially is that we do we do have a relatively limited exposure there and for the companies that we do um you know we do own you know are typically some of the the quote unquote best in in breed right and i think we've you know cnq i think is the one company we own that's sort of a you know a pure producer if you will but they've got some of the leanest operations um you know they've got some of the leanest operations in the business Several of you know the pipelines at the end bridge of the world. Another you know, company you own are, are less infected. Um, you know, companies like Suncor, uh, you know, Imperial Oil, for example, you know, they've all got the, the downstream operations, which means they've got retail, uh, you know, retail gasoline operations. Which um, you know it's a bit of a crash joke at this point, but they can all you know, even with the drop in prices, they can continue to to gouge us, you know, at the pump. But so that at least that side of the business can. Um, you know, can continue to grow. So, you know, we are that that's certainly, you know, admittedly that's that's a hot spot. Um, you know, we one of the areas in particular is, you know, we do own, for example, a you know a, a CNQ bond uh, that's coming due on the fixed income side where, you know, we actually you know a couple of our analysts got in touch with the management team there and revisited the cash flows and their lines of credit just to make sure that you know, they're going to actually be able to pay out that um, you know to pay out the to pay out the, the, our capital back to our investors upon maturity, and then we're confident that they're going to be able to do that, um, you know, upcoming here. But um, you know, I think I think what we've really done, to be honest, Stephen, is just you know gone back and looked at the names we own, and first and foremost, again, it's you know, are we able, you know, are they going to be able to weather the storm, even if it's a prolonged storm, um, you know. And, and I think that they are. You know, I'm not sure we're rushing in to necessarily add to some of those names. Um, you know, just just yet, but but, but again, I, I think that, and we believe. I think again, here perspective is warranted. As sort of dark as it seems right now, the global economy is going to continue to need oil and continue to need energy. And so, I don't think we necessarily want to um, sort of th you know throw these some of these names out of the portfolio now at these valuations when I think there there probably could be better days ahead. Thanks, Mark. That was uh, that was great. I've got um, I've got another quick question from uh, the audience, which is, um, what are the implications to the Canadian economy over the next one to five years with the federal government taking on the load of debt that they uh, are currently taking on, and and what is Guardian um, doing to navigate some of those risks? Yeah, good question. And I think, you know, I, I've got to be, you know, to be frank, I think it's a concern. Uh, I think I think debt, global debt levels were a concern for us coming into this, frankly. Um, and so, you know, frankly, I mean, to be honest, I'm not even sure. I, I think they, I think we can bump along for the next one to five years. You know, frankly, I wonder what my, you know, my kids and my kids' kids are going to be, you know, how they're going to pay for all this eventually down the road. Um, at, at some point, you know, we are we are going to, um, you know, somebody's going to have to pay for this eventually. Um, you know, I, I think that the um, certainly the there's going to be have to be some uh, austerity measures that come into place to you know to try to bring the debt level under under control. Um, I think with in the in the immediate in the immediate concern, you know the. Um, so the, the initial concern, or excuse me, in the, in the immediate time frame, with interest rates being so low, it, it's not really a significant concern because the, the debt servicing costs are not extremely high. I think sort of the, um, you know, the, the call it the worst case scenario coming out of all this would be that we get a, a, a significant round of inflation. And, and I mean, maybe that's a byproduct, byproduct of, of the economy bouncing back quickly. If we do get inflation and interest rates start ticking up, 
um, you know, then we will see, you know, certainly then what, what we'll see is those debt servicing costs rise, um, you know, which puts the, puts the, the federal government in, in a more challenging situation. Um, you know, I think it's more, I think it's more manageable in, in, in North America where, you know, as bad as it sounds, we, we frankly almost have the capacity to some extent to, you know, to continually, you know, grow the deficit and, and print money for now anyway to get through this, this period of time. But, um, you know, for the most part, we don't, you know, I, I think if we, if certainly if we did get to the point where, you know, I mean, we were talking about, you know, if we were worrying about major, um, you know, if we we're worrying about major governments around the world defaulting, uh, you know, I think, I think that would, just generally speaking, that would dictate a much more defensive posture in, you know, in, in terms of the positioning in the portfolio. So it's not that we necessarily own a bunch of government of Canada debt or something that we would be worried about. But, you know, I think if we, if we were really worried about gov federal government defaulting, you know, that, that, that would, in theory, say we're in, you know, we're in a full-blown financial crisis, which would probably take the risk levels in the portfolio significantly lower than 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 where they are today you know certainly much much more towards an, an underweight level in terms of just the, the general risk of the portfolio because i think that would you know present a more a more broad based um you know negative economic scenario certainly if that was beginning to happen appreciate that mark um one other question um in your presentation you mentioned the liquidity risks within the bond market that we went through uh recently mm -hmm. um does guardian believe that governments around uh, the world have done enough to um i guess inject uh liquidity to the marketplace and if not do you guys feel that there would be more uh, uh more measures uh, forthcoming yeah, good question. I think the, you know, I think our general, I think our general sentiment, especially in, in Canada, is frankly that the, you know, the issues had already began to resolve themselves before the central bank, you know, came to the party, so to speak. So, you know, it was just last week, the central bank announced that they would step in and begin buying government, or excuse me, non-government or corporate bonds. Well, governments around the world, I mean, the United States, for example, has been doing that, you know, already for weeks and, and has in the past, but, you know, restarted that, you know, weeks ago now. So I think, um, you know, as historic as it was for the, the central bank to, to make that move in Canada, and I think it's helpful, you know, they were they were effectively late. And, and really when, you know, the mark, it was that week of uh, March 16th to 20th when the equity markets were bottoming out and, you know, liquidity was drying up and, you know, even in the um, you know even in the high quality corporate space, you know while you could still sell uh, you know, while you could stay still still sell a good quality corporate bond, you you weren't really getting a fair price for it, um, you know. And I think that was the time we needed the central bank to step in, if only from a confidence measure before the money started flowing. Um, but they didn't, and and when the you know broader equity market started to recover, that that liquidity opened up a little bit, and and the the bid ask spreads narrowed. So you know I think I think they were a bit late, um, but but you know we do think that what they're doing is 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 helpful, and I think that the, I think that we and and I think most you know what the market can take some measure of solace in is is they stand ready. I think at this point to do more, right? I mean I think they've signaled that they're going to do everything everything it it takes um you know to again make sure this health crisis doesn't turn into a full-blown uh, financial crisis and and that might be you know a challenge but um you know i think the measures they've taken are, are appropriate um you know on the other hand that you know we, we the, the prior question was sort of about the long-term consequences potentially of all this so it is it is a balancing act uh but i think what they've they've come to the table with for now anyway seems to be sufficient and, and I think there there's likely to be more I, I think in the United States they've got I think another 450 billion dollar stimulus package ready so um, you know I, I again I think governments around the world are have the taps turned on and they're going to be willing to to leave them on um, you know I guess the question is will it all be enough you know <laughs> I wish I had the answer for you I mean I hope it is for you know for for the economy and all the small business owners and, and the people who've hopefully temporarily lost their job but um, you know, we we just don't we just we just don't quite know at this point if you know if it will be enough. But again, I think they're you know they're they're pulling out all the stops for for the most part. Um, 
even if you know the, the exact timing or the nature of them isn't perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, this is the last and final question we have for you. Um, this comes in from the audience and it's, uh, what is your best guess of length of time to cover the current losses in a portfolio? So shortest time guess versus longest time guess. And I know nobody has a crystal ball, but um, this is one that might put you a little bit more on the spot. No, no that's a good that's a good question. Yeah. Um, the easy, the easy answer, as you said, is we don't know for sure, uh, but that's not a great answer and that's not the full answer. You know, we we can look back and, and so historically, um, you know, I, I guess one thing I would I would point to is, you know, when when we see, when we see the volatility spike the way it has in the market um, and, and it has since retracted a little bit. So you know, when we see levels hit that peak that we saw, you know, Typically, you know, portfolios are, uh, or excuse me, typically the markets are, are positive, you know, one year, three year, and five years out, and, and fairly strongly so. Um, you know, I think our, you know, I think our, our sort of our, the, the best case scenario um, is if we get a, and, the, and this is, you know, I say this because this is what the market is responding to is, uh, you know, if there is a, um, you know, if there's a treatment so not necessarily, you know, the best case scenario is if we find a treatment for this virus. And of, of course, you know, it's always health first and, and foremost, but economically, if we have a treatment where people can have a sense that, you know, even if I can track this, you know, I don't have to worry about dying necessarily. Um, I think that will allow the economy to open up quicker. And under that case scenario, you know, I think that's where the upside risk, if you will, comes from, is that, you know, that treat a treatment allows the economy to get back working before there's a vaccine, uh, which I think the markets and, you know, with there's, you know, Gilead has a trial, a, a pharmaceutical company has a trial in place where the initial responses have been very positive, you know, and that is, you know, people are watching that closely and that spurred on a bit of a rally in the market. So, you know, I think if, if that scenario plays out, um, you know, then, then, you know, I mean, be best case scenario, I mean, we, we could recoup much of this, you know, potentially by, by this time next year. I mean, it's not, that's not unrealistic. Um, you know, if we have to wait till the vaccine, I guess the best case scenario is that's ready next spring, potentially next fall, um, you know, which maybe puts the timeline of opening the economy up a little bit longer. Um, you know, but, you know, you know, I, I will say that barring the, um, you know, barring the unforeseen, I, I think, you know, 18 to 24 months out, I think we're looking, you know, even in that, you know, even if we have to endure a period for that long, I think, I think markets will be recovering throughout that time and, you know, Again, I think that's, you know, no, nobody knows for sure, but, you know, I think even under, you know, a prolonged economic downturn here that maybe last year or, you know, um, I should say depressed economic uh, activity, uh, an environment of that nature, uh, you know, I think at least by sometime next year, I mean, worst case scenario, we get back to some sort of normalcy and markets can put a number on this. And, you know, I think we're, you know, I think, I think potentially, you know, we're not sort of in a, in a period where markets are going to be negative for, for five years, right? I don't think that's the nature of this crisis. And, um, you know, certainly I think, you know, we look back to 9-11, which is sort of another external shock that, that shook the markets and they recovered fairly quickly. So, you know, I don't want to be overly optimistic, but, you know, I, I think, um, and we're bracing for all scenarios, but I don't think it will necessarily be as, as negative as some of the news is today, I don't necessarily think it's going to stay that way very long. And I would I would go back to my comment about markets being forward looking. And as soon as we can get some stability in terms of activity and and health wise, uh, you know, things may well recover quicker than than people anticipate. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mark. I think the last uh, 55 minutes has gone a long way to helping us all understand what Guardian's doing to navigate these choppy waters and uh, you know, prepare us for what lies ahead. Uh, if anyone uh, had a question uh, that they didn't um, have an opportunity to ask, uh, we'll certainly be available offline. So please uh, email um, uh, one of your advisors and we'll be able to get a response from Mark uh, directly. Um, in the days and weeks ahead, please remain healthy and stay positive. Um, we will get through this and I wanted to thank everybody, including Mark, for joining us today. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody.